right? Okay, today we are looking at the ministries of Jesus. This is lecture five or week five in our class. And um, last week we talked about the gospel of the kingdom of God. You want to make a note of that because I'm going to talk about the kingdom of God again a little bit today in the context of the focus of Jesus' uh, teaching. The ministries of Jesus we're going to talk about today is what did Jesus actually do in terms of his ministry activities when he was on earth? Particularly, we're going to talk about uh, teaching, healing, and exorcism uh, today. We may get into a little bit of some of the, the sonship claims today, but I probably am going to save that for next week. Um, next week, we will deal with relationships. Jesus, his relationship to the Father and to the followers, that is the, particularly the Twelve, but all of his disciples during the, his time on earth. Week 7, we'll look at rejection in the last days. Why was Jesus rejected? Um, what was, how did all of that happen? And then the last days uh, on earth, his last days on earth, leading up to his execution, and then his resurrection and ascension. And then week 8, we will look at sort of the ramifications of the incarnation, that is, sin and its remedy. Um, to look again at our brokenness, the human need that exists in all of us, and how it is that the incarnation of Jesus, the life and ministry of Jesus is the remedy for that, okay? Now today I want us to start off talking about uh, Jesus' ministry in terms of the ministry of teaching. And uh, I think it would, just from reading the Gospels, we can say without fear of contradiction that Jesus was an extraordinary teacher. Um, he was the great teacher. His, his followers called him rabbi, which means teacher. And down through the ages, even people who didn't have a, a particular spiritual inclination to Jesus recognized that he was a teacher who had extraordinary gifts in how he communicated. The uh, first way that Jesus stood out as, as a teacher is that he taught with originality and with personal authority. Now, you need to understand that the rabbis of his day, the, the authorities, the religious authorities of his day, would have considered it inappropriate to speak from their own authority or to speak what they thought. Typically in the first century, the teachers and rabbis of the Jewish faith would have always quoted some precedent. They would have said, the Rabbi Akiva says, or Rabbi Hillel said. It was almost like a legal system. You know, the legal system in the United States is based upon precedent. If there has previously been established a law, a decision regarding a law, then you can claim that precedent applies to, to the situation or the case that you have right now. Well, that's very much the way the Jewish authorities thought. They would refer to something that a previous, uh, particularly a well-known rabbi had said, as a precedent establishing how the law of God should be applied in a particular case. It, it was unheard of for them to say, here's what I think. And yet, in effect, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus did not quote others. He did not quote Hillel or Shammai or um, uh, Akiva or any of the other great rabbis that came before him. Jesus, in fact, often said, you have heard it said, and he will quote some, you know, some base knowledge that the uh, Jews would have had, and he said, but truly, I say to you, in other words, as different from that. So he taught from a basis of personal authority, unlike anybody else. And it's, they, they comment on it a great deal. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, they go on to, to extensively identify the fact that people were so impressed with him, particularly because they would say, this man teaches with authority. We've never heard anybody like this. Um, so his truly, I say to you. And there are a couple of places where he says, truly, truly, I say to you. The word truly is literally in the Hebrew, amen. That's what amen means, truly. Uh, it's set. That's absolute. Amen. So, truly I say to you, or truly, truly I say to you, was the mark of Jesus' teaching style. He had authority that he claimed of his own, and from his own, uh, his own personal authority. Secondly, his teaching style, um, his, his teaching style captivated audiences. He had a very different way of going about it. Not only did he claim his own authority and not quote other, other authorities, but he didn't use any philosophical jargon. The Jewish authorities in his day were very philosophically oriented, and they tend to talk in, in theological language and philosophical language um, and in a way that people didn't really relate to, like a lot of preachers today. Okay? They, they talk in 
in Christianese or in terms that most people don't use every day, and so they weren't comfortable with it. Well, that was very much the case for the rabbis in Jesus' time. But that was not how Jesus taught. Instead, he used very down-to-earth language. He taught the way people really talk in real life, and they related to that. Um, he used stories from everyday life to illustrate what he was talking about. My, my <coughs> preaching professor, Ian Pitt Watson, said that when, we, when you preach, you have a responsibility to tell two stories, to tell God's story and to tell our story. And particularly, how do those two things go together? So the tendency that so many human preachers have is to either focus all on you know, theological, metaphysical, God stuff, and so people go away saying, I don't see at all how that applied to me. Or they just get up there and tell cute stories and fun stories and anecdotes about their life, and you go away saying, well, that was fun and interesting, but I don't know that I know any more about God than I did before. So the challenge is to do both of those things, and Jesus is the perfect example of that. He spoke of God and the kingdom of God, we'll talk about it again in a minute, um, as his primary focus, that's the primary core message that he had, but he did so in language and with everyday stories. In fact, the definition of a parable, which we'll talk about, is a story taken from everyday life that communicates an, a, an important spiritual truth or a profound spiritual truth. And so Jesus, that's one of the reasons he used parables, is because it was very consistent with using everyday kinds of things. And yet he also spoke in a way that when he talked about everyday life, he would use these kind of wild examples in order to get people's attention. The idea, you know, uh, that it's easier for a rich man, it's, it's, it's as easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle as for a rich man to get into heaven. And people are going, wow, that's a kind of vivid illustration. Charles Williams, and, and I've heard people try to say, oh, it was the... It was a minaret, you know, they called it minarets needles, and the doors were not very tall, and so a camel had to get down and crawl through. That's not what they were talking about, okay? That's people trying to find easy explanations. They literally meant, and sometimes needles were big, but still, for a camel to go through the eye, Charles Williams talked about one long, bloody string of camel, okay? So, yeah, it could be done, <laughs> but it certainly would not be easy. Um, or to talk about someone who is, who is trying to remove a speck from their brother's eye when in fact they've got a plank, basically a two by four in their own. So these very vivid kind of illustrations that Jesus would use that would capture, capture people's attention. This is not highfalutin theological talk. It's very practical kinds of illustrations. It's also true that much of Jesus' teaching was in various kinds of poetic forms. Um, Hebrew writing overall tends to be very poetic. There's a lot of meter to it. Frequently, because we deal with English translations, we don't see that. There are things like, uh, we've I've talked about in some of the classes, uh, chiasmic forms, which sort of build build out to a point and then come back and sort of repeat the same point. <coughs> the Frequently, the, the use of Hebrew letters in certain sequences, um, the fact that Psalm 119, for instance, every chapter of Psalm 119 uh, is marked by a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. You know, that's an obvious form. If you look in your Bibles at, at uh, Psalm 19, 119, it will actually show you what those, those characters are, the Hebrew characters. Usually they're put in the headings. And so there was a lot of poetry. Jesus used even what for us, in many cases, is obvious in the form, the poetic forms that he used. For instance, he, he quite often will use what's called a synonymous parallelism. Meaning, he'll say the same thing two or three or four different ways, for emphasis. An example that you know. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. We've heard that often. And so we miss the fact that it's the same thing said three different ways. That's a poetic form, and it's used for emphasis. It's, it's a synonymous parallelism. And Jesus did that sort of thing often. Say the same thing three different ways in order for it to really sink in, for people really to get the picture. Uh, contrary to that, quite the opposite of it, he would use antithetical parallelisms. And an example would be, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. These are antithetical to one another, both of them truisms. And he would use structure like that all the way through his teaching so that it really stood out and people would remember it. And these, these images are even more powerful in Hebrew than they are in, uh, in English. I want to show you a chart that you may not be able to read from back there, but um, and 
By the way, in addition to my forgetting the camera today, I'm, I'm, I'm only running on half my cylinders because Carolyn's out of town. And so I apologize that the notes for this class and yesterday's class have not been uploaded yet. Uh, the video for yesterday is being uploaded now. So I apologize that we're late on that stuff. We'll get back in sequence. But getting back from a trip, I've not had time both to prepare the materials and to do the technical part of getting everything uploaded. So I apologize. It will be there, but it's not there right now. So this will be available to you probably sometime tonight. Uh, for instance, uh, along the, the left-hand side it's the, are the names of the various kinds of literary or figures of speech, literary tools or figures of speech that Jesus used, and then a description of what they are, and then some examples. For instance, proverbs and aphorisms are short, memorable statements of wisdom or truth, like um, judge not lest ye be judged, or in the English version, do not judge or you too will be judged, the modern version. Uh, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. These are sort of one-liners that have impact. They're sound bites, if you will. And Jesus had quite a few of those. So that they are very short, pithy statements that carry a very important truth to them. Second thing, a way that Jesus talked in terms of literary figures was metaphors, which are comparisons between two unlike things. And actually the difference in a metaphor and a simile is a metaphor says it is the same. A simile says, it's like. Uh, so, uh, metaphor examples would be, you are the light of the world, um, or it said, you are, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the, of the earth, things like that, which are, you are something, or I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So he used a lot of metaphors, these, these uh, very strong sim, uh, symbols. Also, similes, an explicit comparison, which use words as or like. Um, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. So we use simile. Paradox. <coughs> Paradox is two seemingly contradictory things, both of which are still true. Okay. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. He also said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the, the apparent contradiction of the paradoxes that Jesus had, that he was fully God and fully man, for instance, you know, which is not actually in Scripture, but that's a paradox that's, that's taken from Scripture in terms of our faith. He used hyperbole, and people get hung up on this one. Hyperbole is an extreme exaggeration that's used for effect, um, and it's intentionally overstated. For instance, if anyone comes to me does not hate his father and mother, his wife, and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's an overstatement in order to, to demonstrate that compared to relationships in the world, our commitment to God and to Jesus, therefore, has to be even stronger than that. That, that, that has to be more important. I remember Keith Green. You all remember the name Keith Green? He was a Christian musician, died in our crush many, many years ago, but he was sort of one of the early significant contemporary Christian artists and very mission-oriented. And he married uh, Melanie Green, his, his uh, wife, and in the marriage ceremony, his vows were, I promise to always love you second best. Doesn't sound very romantic, but it's very scriptural. Okay. Um, also, again, the hyperbole, easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man into the kingdom of God. Jesus also used puns. We don't think about that. But wordplay, where he played on similarity of words. Um, he said in Matthew 16, And I tell you that you are Peter, which is Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Peter is sort of like, the best translation of that would be Rocky. All right? That's, that was the nickname uh, that Jesus gave to Peter. But he did that play on words. He also in Matthew 23 said, You blind guides, you strain out a gnat. And in Aramaic, a gnat is um, galmai, but swallow a camel, which in Aramaic is gamla. Very similar words. And again, unless you want to read it in the, Ara the uh, Aramaic Targums, then you won't get that. That gnat and camel are very similar words. And Jesus often would do that kind of play on words. Um, he also asked riddles, or, or talked in riddles. And one of the ones that got him in trouble, uh, in terms of with the authorities, was when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He meant his own body. That was a riddle. Um, 
He also said, how can Satan drive out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. So there was a, there was a wordplay riddle in there. And he also used a lot of irony, uh, a deliberate contrast between apparent and intended meanings, ironical statements. Like Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Which of the miracles I've done is, is the thing you're stoning me for? And many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the symbolism in that, in terms of an ironical statement, they are the subjects and they will be cast out. Whereas the others will be brought in. And that's, there's allegory in that as well that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So Jesus spoke in many, many different kinds of literary ways. Um, we often don't pick that up, but it's valuable to us to understand that when we struggle sometimes with the saying of Jesus, to understand that there, this may be a literary form, and we need to step back and figure out, not literally what he's saying, but how is he approaching this from in terms of a literary construction, okay? You understand that? All right, last week I talked about, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, but I have to mention it when we talk about Jesus' teaching, and that is his core message. The core message of Jesus was the kingdom of God. He talked about the kingdom of God, or Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven, um, which is the same thing, because they're used in, when you look at parallel verses in Matthew and the other, in the other Gospels, the verse will be exactly verbatim, except Matthew will use kingdom of heaven and the others will use uh, kingdom of God. It occurs 69 times in 10 different New Testament books, whereas Kingdom of Heaven occurs 32 times in Matthew. So we have over 100 times that this expression occurs. This is the core of Jesus' teaching. Three verses, uh, Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent from Luke 4 and from Luke 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, we talked last week about, uh, about this, but again, this has to be the foundation for any discussion of Jesus' teaching. Uh, the Mark 1.15, the kingdom of God has come near. Kingdom of God does not refer to a place where God rules. It's not, and here we talked last week about the con confusion we get into for language. Kingdom in English means a place. It's the place where a king reigns. That is not what it means in the original Hebrew. What it means is the, the power that the king has to rule, the authority by which he rules. Literally, in the case of how it's used in scripture, it's the presence and power of God's actual rule and reign in the universe. The kingdom is here whenever God exercises his rightful authority over his creation. And Jesus personified that. So when he appeared and said, the kingdom of God is in your midst, he was saying, the rule, the authority, the sovereignty, the reign of God is present right in front of you right now because I am he. Um, he proclaimed, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God in both words and in works, both by what he said and by what he did. So today we're going to be talking about both of those, the teaching and then also the healing and exercising by what he said and by what he did. And everything links back to this theme. Everything Jesus said and did in one way or another links back to this theme of the kingdom of God. If you want to understand um, Jesus and his teaching and his ministry and why he came, you have to have a conception of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not, contrary to what some people believe, primarily in heaven or inside us, but rather it is everywhere that God reigns over his creation. There are places in which God has not manifested his authority, not because he can't, but because he has chosen not to yet. The devil, for instance, is uh, the ruler over the world for right now because God allows him to be. That's why there is so much brokenness and pain in the world. At the right time, the fullness of time, as Scripture says, that will change. And God's sovereignty, His kingdom, will be put in place over all of His creation. And the difficulty, too, is some of the verses, Jesus seems to be saying the kingdom is already come. The kingdom is in your midst, for instance. In other places, He says the kingdom is not yet fully realized. And so there is this sense in which it is already, but not yet. Both and. It is here, but it's not fully realized yet. 
Um, I used the example last week, if you weren't here, the U2 song. Uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, even though one of the stances talks about Jesus and carrying my sins to the cross, and yet it gets, goes to the chorus. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, because the kingdom of God has made its presence known in Jesus Christ, and yet the consummation, the final fulfillment of all that has not happened. And the kingdom of God will not be fulfilled by human effort, but by the culmination of Jesus' sacrificial act on the cross. Ultimately, with Jesus' declaration that he was the kingdom of God incarnate, and he says that very clearly in places where he says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Um, when he appears at the start of his ministry in uh, Galilee, and he goes to a synagogue, this is recorded in Luke 4, and he stands up to speak. He reads from a scripture that the people, local teachers could come. There was no priest in the synagogues. And so if somebody came visiting, um, because all Jewish men were supposed to have been trained in reading the scripture and in meditating on scripture and in talking about scripture, it was thought that if there was a visitor, you would invite them to read from, from the scrolls and to speak. So in, in Luke 4, Jesus stands up and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, the 61st chapter, and he says... The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord. And then he sat down after reading, reading the scroll, and they always talk, seated, which sounds great to me. I'm going to try that. <laughs> um, he sat down and said, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your presence. So this description from Isaiah 61 of what the kingdom of God was going to look like, that the good news would be preached to the poor, the freedom would be proclaimed to the prisoner, the sight would receive, the blind would receive their sight, the oppressed would be released, and the year of the Lord's favor would be proclaimed. That is a description in Isaiah of what the kingdom of God will look like when it is fulfilled. And Jesus read that passage and said, Today this has been fulfilled in your presence. And they were ready to stone him for it. I mean, they freaked out when he said that. Like, who do you think you are, kind of thing. But it is clear from that passage and many other places that Jesus saw his incarnate presence as being the presence of the kingdom of God on earth. And those who were in his presence were in the presence of the kingdom. The authority, the sovereignty of God incarnate in their midst. Um, so that is the ultimate message and everything else, we're going to talk about the parables in a minute, tied back to that. Frequently, if we, have, if we struggle with interpreting something that is in the gospel, something Jesus has said, if we step back from it and think about how does this fit in with the theme of the kingdom of God, with the presence of the sovereignty of God and the power of God in the world, then things become clear because everything was, was intended to be in support of that, everything else that Jesus said. Um, and that kingdom is already and yet not yet. So a central message was the kingdom of God. <clears throat> the next question that we have is Jesus, uh, I think in, in Jesus' teaching, is to look at his relationship with the law. Um, it, it's easy to get confused about this because on the one hand, like in Matthew 5, Jesus affirms that the law, that is the Mosaic law, the law that God had given to the Hebrew people, that the law was eternally valid. Jesus was very clear about that. He said not the smallest letter would disappear from the law until it was fulfilled. Every jot and tittle, to go back to the, uh, to the King James. So he, he validated the law of Moses that God had given to the Hebrew people at Sinai, which we looked at yesterday, if you were in our Pentateuch class. Um, and yet at the same time, having said that the law will last forever, it is eternal, he then turns around and seems to ignore certain aspects of it, or just either ignore them or alter them, change them, make them something different. This is one of the other things that the Jews had such trouble with him, uh, trouble with him about. Why the authorities, the religious authorities, had trouble accepting Jesus is he didn't seem to be obeying the law. For instance, the Sabbath laws. Um, Jesus very clearly violated the strictest interpretation of those laws by healing on the Sabbath, which was considered an act of work by allowing his uh, followers, the disciples or apostles, to both apostles and disciples, who walking through a grain field on Sunday and they hadn't eaten, so they're picking heads off the grain and eating it. Well, that was considered work. You're harvesting grain, even if you're doing it one, you know, one finger pull at a time. 
and they accused him of that. And he, he in no way reprimanded his followers for that. He seemed to neutralize the Sabbath command um, and defended his disciples rather than chastising them for breaking the Sabbath. So how are we supposed to understand that? I think there's two ways we can understand Jesus' relationship to the law and his teaching and his actions with regard to that. One, which we have here, is Jesus was focused not on the letter of the law, which he felt had been misused by the Jews of his time, but rather he was focused on the spirit of the law, what was behind it, the true essence and the purpose of the law. That's the first thing, and I'm going to open that up a little bit. And the second thing is, Jesus was focused on the fact that he, the kingdom of God incarnate, was the fulfillment of the law. And that in his presence, he calls himself, for instance, when they're talking about the Sabbath, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. That everything must be interpreted now based upon Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the kingdom of God incarnate, in their presence. And so he dealt with both of those. Um, I think that we sometimes talk about the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Well, that's very much what Jesus was concerned with. He wanted to make sure that they understood that it was the spirit of the law, what God intended, rather than the letter of the law that was most important. He chastised the Pharisees for making sure they gave one-tenth of each of their herbs, and yet they denied justice, and they denied you know, compassion. They refused the important things, and focused on trying to obey the law and all the tiny things. And Jesus said, you got it all wrong. You got it backwards. You should be focusing on the intent behind this, the nature of God, the presence of God in his law. And so therefore, justice and mercy and faithfulness should be the focus. That's what the law is really about. Not making sure you give one-tenth of your mint and one-tenth of your uh, rue and one-tenth of your rosemary. Okay? That's not the focus. And so uh, in that way, Jesus very much is taking people back to the intention of the law. What is supposed to be the, uh, the reflection of God's character in the true meaning and spirit of the law. That's the first thing. Um, and Jesus, for instance, when he is talking about healing, um, in one place, the Pharisees on Sunday, uh, or Saturday, excuse me, on the Sabbath, are watching him so closely because they think he might heal somebody, and they're going to jump him if he does. Okay, they're going to make a big deal out of it if he heals somebody. And Jesus looks at them and says, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? And then he proceeds to heal a man. And as often happened, after setting it up the way he did, with other people around, the Pharisees couldn't very well make a scene because Jesus, they, would have, you know, they would have fallen into... Uh, the error that Jesus had just identified of thinking that the point of the Sabbath was you can't do anything rather than this is a day that is given to people. And he makes, a, he makes a clear teaching about the fact that the Sabbath is intended for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was given as a day of rest and a day of, of worship and a day in which people recognize that God loves them and that they, they're not slaves anymore and they don't have to work seven days a week uh, under the taskmaster, but rather that there is one day a week that they can recognize that they are can rest, worship God, recognize His pleasure in their existence. And so Jesus brought them back to that, the true meaning of this thing. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes through a whole series of antithetical statements where He says, you heard it said, but I say to you. For instance, He says uh, that, that murder is a sin, but not just murder. He says, anger, that is murder in your heart, is just as much of a sin. He says to commit adultery is a sin, but if you lust in your heart, if you commit adultery of the heart, you have also sinned. And so you see he's going back to what the real meaning is. It's not the literalness of an act so much as the intent behind it. He also talks about divorce being allowed by Moses, but that was only because of human sinfulness. It was a concession to human sinfulness, and that in fact God would desire that uh, a lot, the lifelong covenant of marriage would be respected and not broken. That that was truly God's will for it. Um, oaths must be kept, he said, but oaths really should be unnecessary if people are acting and speaking with integrity and truthfulness. So he goes behind and underneath all of these laws in order to talk about what the real meaning behind it is. And then, perhaps even more importantly, Jesus made it very clear that he, for instance, saying he was Lord of the Sabbath, that he was the fulfillment of the law. That if there was a radical new orientation that needed to be taken to the law for, uh, to God, by God's people, 
And that's why, if we understand that, that's why the early Christians, after Jesus' ascension, did not struggle with having their day of worship being Sunday instead of Saturday. They very quickly went to what they call the Lord's Day, instead of the Sabbath, in recognition of the fact that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. And how could they do that? The Sabbath was sacred. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It was a huge deal. Obviously, the Pharisees thought so. That's why they gave Jesus so much trouble about it. But they could both set aside the Sabbath obligation and things like the dietary laws, other aspects of the law, because they saw the fulfillment of that. The focus on Jesus, for instance, being resurrected on Sunday and honoring him on that day became more important to them than following the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law about worshiping on Saturday, because Jesus they saw as the fulfillment. He took precedence over the rest of the law. Um, and again, this goes back to Jesus' constantly saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you. That was Jesus' way of saying, I am giving you a new understanding. I am the fulfillment, the culmination of all of that. Jesus' understanding or attitude toward the law has to be seen in the context, again, of his proclaiming the kingdom of God. When Jesus said, I, the kingdom of God is in your midst, I am here, I am in the incarnate one, then they began to understand that Jesus was saying the law is fulfilled. So Jesus could say, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The law will not be done away with until every aspect of it is fulfilled, but Jesus was saying the fulfillment of it is beginning right now in me. And so that changed the way that they could interpret and understand that all the way along. Um, and to understand how Jesus could fulfill the law, what does it mean to say he fulfilled the law? We have to think back about the purpose of the law. Why did the law exist in the first place? I think we need to see that there are two primary reasons why the Mosaic Law was given. And again, we studied that yesterday in the Pentateuch. If you want to go back, you can watch those videos as soon as we get them uploaded. The first reason why the, the Mosaic Law was given was to reveal God's righteous standards to the people. For them to understand what a righteous God expected of them. And so everything Jesus did was to try to reestablish righteousness the righteousness of God the Father as the foundation. The second thing that the Mosaic Law was given for, first to reveal God's standards of righteousness, second was to then provide a means for forgiveness when Israel failed to meet those standards. That's why the law has the sacrificial system and the, the payment of debt. If you read the, the Book of the Covenant, which is uh, Exodus 20 to 24, they'll, it goes into great length. Well, if you hire an animal and the animal dies, uh, then you, whatever you pay for the animal to rent it is sufficient payment, unless it died because you were at fault and then you have to pay the value of it. And it goes into great detail about what the consequences are when you do something wrong. Um, ultimately, the ultimate was sacrifice, the, the shedding of blood. And so when we recognize that one, the law was given to reveal God's righteous standards, and two, it was given to tell the people, what do you do when you fail to meet those standards? Jesus does both of those things. One, by his life, his righteous life, he was without sin, and by his teaching, he establishes very clearly a model for God's um, righteous intent, his righteous standards for human life. And then secondly, in terms of what do you do when you fail to meet those standards, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the fulfillment of that. So Jesus meets both of the expectations for what the Mosaic Law was for, and in that way, he fulfills the law. And we can see that, I think. Um, in terms of what aspects of the law Jesus fulfilled, some people draw a distinction between the different kinds of law. There is, there's actually three different kinds of Old Testament law. There's the civil law, how you run yourself as a country, because the law literally was the constitution for the, for the Jewish people. And it told them how to set up courts, you know, how, to, how to do everything, and how you judge uh, penalties for things. So there's civil law, there also was the ceremonial law, especially related to sacrifice, and then there's the moral law, primarily the Ten Commandments. And I think it's valid to say that the civil laws were for the nation of Israel, and so don't apply to us. The ceremonial laws, that is the sacrificial system, were fulfilled and completely, you know, no longer necessary after Jesus' sacrifice. The moral law does still apply to us. It's still wrong to kill. It's still wrong to steal. It's still wrong to lie. It's still wrong to commit adultery. And we know that. But 
if we do commit those violations of those moral laws, then the satisfaction for that is no longer something we do, but rather us receiving the fact that Jesus died on the cross to cover our sins. Um, in that way, really, Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament laws. Um, the civil laws don't apply anymore because that was just for the nation of Israel. But the ceremonial laws of sacrifice and the moral laws, God, Jesus fulfills all of those. But we respond to that by being as righteous as we can, by living the best we can. So the law has not been abolished. It has been fulfilled. The purpose and function of the law has still been maintained with the coming of Jesus and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God into the world. So we need to understand that was Jesus' relationship with the law. So Jesus focused on the very character of God who gave the law as being most important. And he summed up the whole of the law in love for God and love for each other. What's the first and greatest commandment, he was asked. And he quotes the Old Testament, the Shema, um, Shema Yisrael. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, that you shall love your neighbors as yourself. So, again, Jesus interprets all of the law based upon the nature of God, that we are to love Him, and that we are to be moral in loving one another, looking out for one another. That's the focus that Jesus had. He then emphasized both God's free grace offered to sinners and the high cost of discipleship. Often there are two aspects to this. On the one hand, Jesus is very clear, both by what He teaches and how He lives, that God's grace is available to sinners. Jesus says, it's not the well who need a doctor, but the sick. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. He praises the publicans, the tax collectors, at the same time that he criticizes the Pharisees. Over and over again, Jesus hangs out with the wrong kind of folk. And by his life, by his actions, he demonstrates that God's grace, God's love, is offered to them even more so than those who think they're righteous. He condemns self-righteousness. Many of his parables, many of his stories have to do with people who think they were righteous. And in fact, they were wrong before God. The good guys, by the Jewish standards, are the ones who fall short. The bad guys, by the Jewish standards, are the ones that Jesus lifted up. No better example of that than the, uh, the, the Good Samaritan. We, we have to put ourselves in the context of understanding what the Jews would have heard when Jesus told that story. That a man is attacked and he's left by the side of the road to die. And a, a Pharisee comes along and sees the man, and he walks on the other side of the road. And a scribe comes along, a Levite, sees the man, and he walks on the other side of the road. These are the two ultimate examples of religious righteousness and authority to the Jews. And then a Samaritan, a half-breed, the Jews would have said, who is a heretic because their, their worship was not real Judaism, it was only part Judaism. He comes along, sees the man, picks him up, binds up his wounds, puts him on his own animal, takes him to an innkeeper, has him taken care of, leaves money to take care of him. Now, to the Jews, that would have been an obscenity to hold a, a Samaritan up as being the ideal example while you use a Pharisee and a Levite, the two uh, ideals of <coughs> Jewish religion, as being the bad guys. Jesus did that sort of thing over and over and over again. The Pharisees' prayer was not received, the publican's prayer was. And so Jesus makes it clear, both with his teaching and with the way he lived his life, that God's grace was intended for all people, including the sinners, even especially the sinners. That the, the great physician is there for those who are sick, not those who are well. But at the same time, Jesus talked a lot about the idea that uh, to follow him... There was a huge cost. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. And again, we hear these things so many times. A cross was, again, an obscenity to the Jews. It was, cursed was anyone who hangs on a tree, which is what they understood to be a cross. A cross was for the worst of criminals. Anybody who's going to be crucified is uh, completely an outcast. You would never have anything to do with them if you were righteous. And yet, if you're going to be my disciple, Jesus said, you will take up your cross daily and follow me. Um, over and over and over again, Jesus says, if you want this, if you want to follow me, there is a high price to be paid. 
And some people struggle with that. In fact, a lot, most people struggle with that. How is it that this is free? This grace is free. Salvation is free to those who will accept. And yet Jesus says, you have to live to a very high standard. In fact, he says, if your righteousness is not greater than any of the Pharisees, then you're, you're falling short. Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a, that's a hyperbole. He doesn't really expect us to be perfect, but he's expecting us to be, to be righteous and good as much as we can be. There is a solution for it if we fall short, but that's what he calls us to. How do we reconcile those? I think the way we need to understand that is that salvation is not based upon anything we do except that we receive. It is a free gift, and it is available to everyone, including <coughs> sinners. And yet, once we have received that, once we have get, been given entrance into the kingdom by accepting Jesus Christ, then we have responsibilities. Then there are standards. And so the sequence here is very important. Again, some of you have heard me say many times, it's the, the idea that don't be good in order for God to love you. Let God love you so that you can then be good. And so the offer of salvation in Jesus Christ was free is free and it is for sinners once we have received that then the message to us like Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery is neither do I condemn you but go and sin no more live a righteous life now okay that's how I think we need to understand it it's also true that Jesus taught a great deal about poverty and wealth and some people take Jesus's teaching on poverty and wealth and say oh well he, that's spiritual it's those who are spiritually impoverished. It doesn't really have to do with money. Well, that's not true. <laughs> Jesus' comments about wealth and poverty, there is a spiritual component. For instance, in the Beatitude, he talks about those who are poor in spirit. So there's a poverty of spirit. But many times, like the story of the rich young ruler and, and others, Jesus is actually talking about those who have material wealth and those who don't. Jesus talks about preaching the good news to the poor. That's how he defines himself as part of the kingdom. Again, when John's disciples come to Jesus at John's request and say, are you the one we were waiting for or should we expect somebody else? Jesus says, go back and tell John this. Right? The dead are raised, the blind receive sight, the lepers are healed, the good news is, is preached to the poor. Notice, to the poor. There is a strong emphasis on the idea that Jesus' message is especially for the poor. At one point he even says, you know, those who are wealthy have received their reward already. That it is harder for, for uh, a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Again, a lot of these kinds of things we need to interpret, literally, that there is danger in wealth and that the poor are especially a concern that Jesus had and that God has. That does not mean that money is inherently evil. It is your heart toward it. By definition, a rich man is somebody who's aware of his own wealth. And usually, somebody who believes that his own wealth is because, aren't I good? Right? There are wealthy people who are very compassionate and very caring, who thank God for all the blessings they've received, and they share that with people. Those are not the people Jesus was talking about when he condemned the wealthy. It's the wealthy who believe that their reliance, whether they're conscious of it or not, their reliance is on their wealth. It's on their own means. It's on their own capability. And it's on what they've accumulated. Those are the ones Jesus condemned. And those who are broken in the world and don't have the resources to lift themselves up, Jesus had special compassion for. And when you say that, because all of us are rich, we all have a tendency to want to say, well, yes, but, and find some excuse. But we can't, because Jesus talked about this too often for us to believe that we can just sort of sweep that away. What you do with your money has a direct effect on your spirituality. If you have a wrong relationship with money, then you will be unhealthy spiritually, and there, you're in danger, actually. Uh, in Matthew, when, when Jesus says, I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was uh, thirsty, you did not give me drink. I was in need of clothing, you did not clothe me. I was in prison, you did not uh, visit me. They say, Lord, notice they call him Lord. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or without clothing or in prison and not care for you? And Jesus said, as much as you did not do it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do it for me. 
And then he says the scariest thing, I think, in the whole New Testament. Because he says, Depart from me, you accursed, into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I never knew you. And these are people that called him Lord. I believe there are people whose selfishness is going to... Ultimately, the, the, what it means is their selfishness prevents them from really accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord because they're too focused on their own money. And as a result, they will end up in hell because their money was a barrier that kept them from accepting Jesus, really, even if they talked a good talk. And we need to be very careful about that because Jesus was very clear, I believe, about those things. About the most common thing we know Jesus for in his teaching, and that is his parables. Jesus used parables as, uh, to present vivid and memorial scenes from everyday life to teach profound spiritual truth. That's the definition of a parable. It uses an event, a story from everyday life in order to communicate a profound spiritual truth. Now, Jesus uh, talked in parables, and there were a number of different kinds of parables, but he related to people and where people were and how they really lived by telling parables. Historically, there have been different ideas about how to interpret parables. And through much of the history of the church, they have seen parables as theological allegories. An allegory is something, uh, a story in which the characters or events stand for something else. They represent something else. And the allegories down through the history of the church, starting in probably the third century and on, uh, sometimes just got ridiculous. For instance, Augustine, who I have great respect for, St. Augustine, um, he looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I mentioned earlier, and he said that the man who was beaten was a representative of Adam. The robbers who beat him up were the devil and his angels, or the demons. The priest who walked by was the Old Testament priesthood. The Good Samaritan is Christ. The animal that carries the man represented the incarnation of Christ. The inn that he was taken to was the church, and the innkeeper is the Apostle Paul. <laughs> now, that's just typical of the idea that down through the church, history of the church, they typically thought of parables entirely as allegory, as representing something else, and often very specifically something else. Um, but rather than allegories, a better way for us to understand that parables are as similitudes. A similitude is an expanded or extended simile, meaning something that's like something else. Um, the parables are stories that we should see in almost every case as having one main point, not that each element of it, each character, each event, whatever, represents something else, but rather that the parable has one main point that we need to look at. And modern scholarship, starting really in the late 19th century, has accepted the fact that the historic way of looking at parables as these extended allegories, symbolic uh, meanings, that's really not the way they were intended, and that's not the way we should look at them. That's not to say that some parables don't have allegorical aspects, but you have to be careful about that, or we, we start going off into fairy tale land by adding all this stuff. Okay? I don't think Jesus, telling the Good Samaritan, intended for the innkeeper to be the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Even though, being the Son of God, he may have had a prophetic understanding that Paul was going to be you know, come along, I don't think that was the purpose or the intent in that particular parable. So when we look at parables, I want to give you a number of steps to be able to interpret the parables, I believe, uh, in a reasonable way. First, to understand parables, we need to interpret them, and this is true with all scripture, we need to interpret the parable in the context of Jesus' ministry. We have a, a bad habit of taking scripture and thinking of it without any regard for the fact that there was a particular context in which it was written 2,000 years ago. And particularly in the parables, that there's a particular context in Jesus' ministry. Many of the parables were intended to give a message to the Pharisees who were listening, or to the disciples who were listening. And so the first thing we need to do when we read the parables is be aware of the context in Jesus' ministry when he was presenting that. The second thing is, um, coming back to this theme of the kingdom of God, Every parable that we read, we should think, how does this relate to Jesus' primary message, his core message of the kingdom of God? That is the presence of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the reign of God in his creation, both now and for the future. The already, but not yet. Okay. So always relate back 
when you're reading Jesus, uh, Jesus' messages, especially the parables, how does it relate to his primary message, which is the kingdom of God? When we um, look at some of his parables and realize that the kingdom of God particularly was, uh, Jesus spoke of it with regard to God's love for the lost and for his offering of grace to the sinners. That was a key message when Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst. He was saying salvation has come to you. Um, and you read the parables like the parables of the lost sheep, of the lost coin, of the prodigal son, of the two debtors, of the Pharisee and the tax collector, of the unmerciful servant, of the laborers in the vineyard, the parable of the great banquet. All of those you can very directly relate to the idea of God's sovereignty either being present now or being fulfilled in the days to come. Um, and so we need to understand that. A third key is to recognize for the parables their cultural and literary background in Judaism and the Old Testament. Again, a lot of what Jesus was saying, he was speaking to the mistakes that had been made in Judaism, the mistakes especially that the religious authorities were making. And so many of the parables, we have a better understanding of them if we realize that he was speaking to the leaders of the Jewish faith at that time and uh, can appreciate that in the context also of the Old Testament. Things that are used like yeast or the vineyard, some of the symbols that are in the parables, have very particular meanings from the Old Testament. I'm not suggesting that every parable you have to make it a six-week study in order to figure it out, because the meaning is usually more obvious than that. But there's a depth of meaning that you can gain if you understand that these were in the context of a Jewish people and an Old Testament history. A fourth reason, or a fourth way to view this is to seek out the primary point of the parable. I said a few minutes ago, almost all parables have one primary point. And I think we can, sometimes Jesus comes right out and tells you what that is. For instance, the when he tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee who says, you know, who stands and looks up to heaven and says, God, I thank you, I am not like other, other men, like that, that tax collector over there, but I give a tenth of all that I have, and I fast twice a week, and I'm a really good guy. And then the tax collector will not even come close, and he looks to the ground and beats his chest and says, God, have mercy on me, sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that that man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went away justified. Well, now, when Jesus tells that story, he then interprets it for us. He says um, in Luke 18, 14, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's the point. And he tells us what it is. But even in the places where he doesn't tell us what it is, if we just think about it for a minute, usually the meaning is pretty obvious. Okay? And so think about what the primary point of the parable is, because almost all of them have one primary point. Then we need to be very cautious concerning allegorical elements, thinking that this is a symbol for something else. There are allegorical aspects to it, and we need to recognize that. For instance, the parable of the wicked tenants, where um, the landowner rents his property to the tenants, and he is due part of the produce from, from the, the land. Well, he sends servants, and they beat the servants up, one after the other. They beat them up, send them away, and don't pay what's due. Finally, the landowner says, well, I will send my son, and they will listen to my son. And when the son shows up, the wicked tenants say, well, this is the heir to the property. Let's get rid of him, and then we'll be able to keep the land. So they kill the son. And the landowner comes, kills the wicked tenants, and takes his land back. Now, that is an allegory, because Jesus is talking to the religious authorities. And in that case, it is fair to say that the landowner, who is God, has sent his servants, who were the prophets, to the people who, are, who now possess the land, who were the Israelites. And prophet after prophet came, and the prophets were rejected and beaten and cast out and even killed. And then finally, the landowner sends his own son, and they kill him. This is a prophetic statement from Jesus. So that eventually the landowner, who is God, will punish the wicked tenants, those who currently are in possession of the land, but it's not really theirs. And that is the people of Israel, especially the religious authorities. So there are some that, that there are legitimate allegorical meanings to, but be very careful about that. Because historically, the church has tended to go way overboard on those allegorical elements. Okay? Then we need to determine the narrative function of the parable and the gospel in which it appears. For instance, there are 
in Luke and in Mark, I think it is, there are two parables, and in, they're the same parable. But in Luke, it's prefaced by the fact that, it, and it says, Jesus was near to Jerusalem, and the people were wondering when he was going to issue in the kingdom. And then he tells a parable, and if you understand that context, the parable has a particular meaning appropriate to that expectation. So sometimes you look at the context for that particular uh, gospel, even, and how it's used in order to better understand what the meaning of it is. Okay? Any questions about that? John? Um, Ross, I got this is a question that, that I've pondered for a long time. In, in Mark and in Matthew, we talk about parables. It appears, it appears that Jesus spoke in parables deliberately withholding understanding and yet explaining this later to his disciples. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, that's very true. <laughs> that's exactly what he did. In fact, I think I've got... Let me see right here. I've, I've got the verses okay. here. If you... No. Um, Jesus even says, in more than one place, I talk in parables so that you can understand. And then it says he would go and explain it to the, you know, if they didn't get it, to the disciples, to the apostles especially, but to others as well, not just the twelve. But so that they won't understand. And in the parable of the sower, for instance, he quotes Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah says, so that seeing that, you know, they will not see and hearing they will not hear, um, lest they open their eyes and ears and believe. The indication there is that Jesus speaks in parables, both because that helps reveal what his intention is. I mean, the, the, the wonderful little examples help people understand. But there are places in which he speaks in riddles, as I said earlier, and where he uses parables in mysterious ways, because um, people who were not willing to open their hearts, people who were not willing to be receptive of him, for instance, the Pharisees, who started out with the presumption, we don't like this guy, we don't, we don't like what he stands for. We don't like where he's going with this stuff. We don't like what he's having to say. We don't like the fact that he challenges our authorities. Speaking in parables, their eyes were blinded and their ears were shut, and they didn't get it. If he had spoken very plainly and said, let me explain to, to everybody, not just to his disciples, what this means, then they would have probably gotten it or gotten some of it. But the idea is they had made a decision. I preached on the parable of the sower not too long ago, and I said, it's, it's, um, Jesus seems to be saying, if you choose to reject God, then you, you may not have the opportunity to change your mind later. You may be blinded. So you make the choice to reject Jesus, you may not have the chance to go back. And the, the analogy I used was, it's like if you're very determined as a child to run away from home, you may find you can't find your way back again. So those who chose to block themselves off from Jesus, God literally blinded them and deafened them to the truth so they couldn't come back. But it was their choice, ultimately. God just said, fine, that's what you want. That's what you're going to get. It's like as C.S. Lewis says, ultimately God will give all of us what we want. Those who want to be in fellowship and relationship with God through Jesus, he will give us that. Those who choose against God, God will give them what they want too. And that is what I think it means when it says that God both, or Jesus used parables both to reveal to those who were open to it, because the, 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 the metaphors and similes and whatnot in the parables, that they, it meant something to them, and they could relate to that. It was every day. But those who were already decided against Jesus, they just didn't get it. And that, in the same way that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, if you go through and look at the places where it says, and there are ten different places it says the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, the first five of them, it says, in one way or another, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then, after a while, God said, fine, in order to show my power, I'm not going to let you understand this, Pharaoh. I'm not going to let you give in. And then it says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So I think it's because those who didn't want to hear, God wouldn't let them. Okay? Is that fair? All right. Um, I want to spend a few minutes now talking about... The ministry of exorcism and healing that Jesus, that Jesus pursued. Um, and there's a larger sense in which we're talking here about miracles. And the difficulty people have with miracles. Um, especially since the 18th century, 18th, 19th, 20th century, there is a, a predominant worldview that is rationalistic. 
Meaning, if you can't figure it out with your mind, your rationality, then it can't be true. If you can't explain it according to natural law, or you can't reproduce it in science, that's the scientific method, the, the issue of re reproducibility, then it can be true. Predominantly, I think we need to understand that you know, with the Enlightenment movement, in 18th and 19th century especially, there were two dominant philosophies that came along in that time. Um, both of which were anti-miracle, and they became the dominant philosophies of the day that still affect us today as, as a Western culture. The first one was deism. Deism is a belief that there may be a divine power, but either that divine power is no longer available to us, or more often, that he went on vacation, uh, you know, and he, he, he set everything in motion and left. The idea of this great clockwork, that God set everything up, he set up the ordered world, and he turned it loose, and then he left. And so everything happens according to the natural order, and therefore, since God isn't, isn't no longer involved, nothing can happen that violates that natural order that he set up. Okay? You see how that precludes miracles. The second philosophy that came along in the Enlightenment was philosophical materialism. Materialism asserts that the world is a closed system that uh, allows for cause and effect. For every cause, there is an effect, and that never varies. There is no room for outside intervention by anything miraculous. There's no room for any miracles, because that would be contrary to the materialistic idea of everything being cause and effect. Right? So those two things, theism or philosophical materialism, became the, the systems from which everyone argued against anything miraculous being even possible. It's fascinating to me, um, both of those, particularly materialism, which is the thing that, that is more common today, uh, materialism assumes its own conclusion. It assumes that this is impossible, and then it argues for the impossibility of it based upon the fact that it's not possible. There is a circular reasoning to that. And I find it fascinating that, uh, I mean, people who say that, you know, well, miracles are contrary to science, actually they're not. Because science, if you want to do a, a strict definition, science is the <coughs> process of experimenting and observing the results of that experimentation and then drawing conclusions from that. Or observing natural phenomena, you know, whatever's around you, uh, observing it, recording it, drawing conclusions from it. It does not presume one way or the other about things having to meet the natural order. Science deals with what's there, not presume what can't be there. True science. Now, Science that is based upon materialistic philosophy starts out with presumptions. Well, there can't be anything outside of the natural order. One of the things that I find fascinating is that one of the philosophers that is most often quoted as arguing philosophically against miracles is David Hume, who is a Scottish philosopher. Um, and Hume was a hero of mine back in my philosophy days. Okay? Mm -hmm. and Hume, Kant, and Hegel were my trinity. And David Hume was the founder of philosophical skepticism. Because prior to Hume, everybody made the assumption that there was a predictable cause and effect. You know, that if, and they used the example of a billiard table. If, if the cue ball always hits a ball in the same place at the same speed with the same spin, in other words, that the cause is the same, the effect is always going to be the same. Cause and effect is predictable, based upon you know, all experience. Well, David Hume comes along and he argues that no, the only thing we can say is that every time previously that's happened, we, we philosophically, logically can't argue that it's got, got to do it that way next time. Now that was the foundation of skepticism, and no one has ever effectively refuted that. Okay? Uh, Hume's skepticism still stands. Now he used that skepticism to deny religion and everything else, but the weird thing to me is he uses it to argue against miracles, when in effect, miracles are non-conformity to cause and effect, which is exactly what his skeptical philosophy, or skepticism philosophy, argued. I never have understood how it is that David Hume thought his argument proved the, in, uh, the lack of uh, potential for miracles, when in fact, his whole argument was, you can't say for sure what's going to happen next. Maybe somebody comes along and adds a new element to it, okay? So, but that's sort of the background for it, and I say very simply, belief or disbelief in miracles is based upon a person's philosophical or historical presuppositions. Um, Hume, for instance, had four arguments that he made, and one of them was 
No miracle has ever been attested to by a sufficient number of educated and rational people to be proven true. That's one of his arguments. Well, excuse me, but there have been a whole lot of educated and rational people in the history of the church that have experienced miracles and want to test to that. The Apostle Paul was very well educated and very rational. Just read his writings. Okay? Uh, and he certainly would attest to and was party to miracles. So Hume's other arguments follow along that line. There's a presumption behind them that, you know, if you're going to start out with that presumption, then sure you're not going to believe in miracles. If you're completely open, then the potential is there. Now, one of the things they claim is that there's no historicity to the idea of miracles. In other words, there's never been any historical evidence of miracles. Well, it's interesting that there is nearly universal acceptance by both conservatives and liberals, Christians and anti-Christians, that Jesus was viewed by his contemporaries as, predominantly, as a healer and exorcist. Josephus identifies him as a worker of great miracles, a historian. Celsus, who was a Gnostic, who um, you know, early church fathers had to argue against, said that Jesus apparently did some very, very amazing things because he was a really good music, a magician, musician, magician. So even people who opposed Christianity identified that Jesus was recognized as a doer of great works, of miracles, if you will. So there's a historical precedent for Jesus being a miracle worker, even for the people who are against him. And, and people who were neutral, who didn't have a side particularly, as well as those who were supporting of it. So, and, and nobody can really argue with that. And yet they just sort of discount it when they start talking about, you know, the historical support for the idea of miraculous capability of Jesus doing miracles. Uh, some people will claim that Jesus performing miracles, that this idea was added later by the church and that there were historical precedents for it in the first century. They'll talk about first century magicians. But the problem is that the first century magicians had a very, in any account we have of first century magicians, and there's some in the New Testament. You know, we have magicians, Simon uh, the Magus or the magician who wants to buy the power to do the miracles that, that the apostles are doing, um, and others. Well, they typically would use incantations or potions or make a big scene. You know, they had to call on the spirits and all kinds of stuff. None of that is anything like the miraculous events that are recorded for Jesus, where Jesus simply speaks and demons come out. He says, take up your bed and walk. And the man takes up his bed and walk. There are no potions, no incantations, no magical powers, no calling on spirits, none of the sort of thing that was attributed to first century magicians. Uh, they also will talk about Hellenistic divine men, because there were these sort of divine heroes, sort of literally god men, theos anthropos, um, in the Hellenistic legends. But they're not, for the most part, not historical characters. They are the heroes. And yet again, none of the stories about them have any, any similarity at all to Jesus. Plus the fact that uh, some of them are recorded later, after the time of Jesus, you know, when the, the Greeks were trying to sort of revive their, um, their uh, philosophy and religious system, and they came up with the divine heroes idea. And then charismatic holy men. For instance, some, some rabbis were claimed to have power to call on rain and to uh, heal people and whatnot. But most of those come from much later. They come from the, we find them in the Talmud, which was written quite a bit after the Gospels were written. And so the idea that <coughs> Jesus' stories are based upon that simply don't make sense. None of the arguments for the miraculous powers of Jesus, the stories of his, Jesus, of his miracles, coming from somewhere else, none of them are really convincing. No, it's, they're straining to try to make up some excuse for why this could not have been a historical reality. Um, I think we do need to recognize that miracles are fundamental to Jesus' ministry because Jesus' miracles revealed the power and presence of the kingdom of God in his actions. Jesus performed miracles for two reasons. One, out of compassion. That is, the, the miracles of healing and raising the dead. Examples like Right before he raises Lazarus from the dead, he sees Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters and his friends who are weeping for the death of their brother, and Jesus weeps. You know, shortest verse in the King James, Jesus wept. Well, he doesn't cry because, because uh, Lazarus is dead, because he raises Lazarus from the dead about three minutes later. He's weeping out of compassion for the suffering and the grief that exists in uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus' friends, because he knows that that wasn't the way God intended for the world to be. 
death was, is a foreigner. It's not supposed to be the way our lives end. And then he raises him from the dead. So Jesus healed, performed miracles of healing out of compassion. And the second reason he does miracles is in order to reveal the power and presence of the kingdom of God. To show that I'm not just some other itinerant teacher or preacher. There is power here like you have never seen. And it is the presence of the kingdom of God. Jesus never said, he could have, he could have focused on himself and said, ain't I grand? But instead he focused on God the Father and on the presence of the kingdom of God, the rightful reign and sovereignty and rule of God in creation. All right? Now Jesus, in fact, the fact that Jesus didn't tout himself as much, he did use, he called himself the Son of Man, which next week we're going to talk about the meaning behind that. Uh, he allowed himself to be called the Son of God. He allowed himself to be acknowledged as the Messiah. So he allowed other people to give him recognition. He very seldom spoke boldly himself about who he was and or what his power was. And that's one of the things that people have struggled with so much is, well, that, that he was the Son of God. Why, is it, why wasn't he more obvious about it? Because Jesus was there to glorify the Father in heaven and to declare the presence of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit later came in order to glorify Jesus. That was one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. But that came later. And I think we also need to understand um, that there is significance in uh, Jesus' nature miracles. The nature miracles are those miracles that Jesus performs related to nature, like um, turning the loaves and fishes into enough to feed 5,000 or 7,000 people, um, to still the, the storm, to walk on water. So these are the more, or turn water into wine, and these are the nature miracles because it has him affecting some natural aspect of, of the creation to his will. Nature miracles are the ones that, that the skeptics have the most trouble with. You know, they can accept the healing because, well, people, people get better. <laughs> they can accept all sorts of things, but the idea of calming the storm or turning water into wine or taking you know, a few loaves and fishes and feeding thousands of people with it, they go, yeah, not, not, not so much. You know, they have trouble with that one. And yet, one of the things that we can see is that when you look at the context of the nature miracles, quite often we need to understand those as enacted parables. Jesus does something miraculous with nature in order to reveal the kingdom of God, I need to make that up the case, the kingdom of God breaking into the world and visibly uh, enacting or being sort of a dramatic presentation of truths that are conveyed in parables. Okay? So there's very strong sort of parabolic kind of uh, meaning behind many of the nature miracles that Jesus performs. And again, the only reason for rejecting the idea of the nature miracles or any other miracles is if you assume that miracles can exist in the first place. If you believe there is a God, and you believe God is alive and active and not on vacation somewhere else, and that he chooses from time to time to interact with the world, then you believe in the possibility of miracles. Mm -hmm. It's just like people who say, well, you know, I, I, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but uh, this whole thing about the devil and demons, I don't buy that. You know what? If you don't believe in the spiritual realm as it's portrayed in scripture, if you don't believe in the dark side of the spiritual realm, how can you say you believe in the, in the, the side of light? Um, it's a package deal. You either believe it or you don't. You don't pick and choose and go, like some scholars say, well, I believe that miracle probably was true. I, I don't think, that, I don't think he, would have, he could have done that. You know, that's beyond him. Really? If he is, if he is acting in the, the declaration for the kingdom of God, the power of God, the reign of God in the world, then nothing was beyond his capability. Mm -hmm. um, and yet that tends to be um, people's approach to it. People probably have more trouble um, even more than the nature miracles, people have trouble with the idea of exorcism. The idea that Jesus drove out demons. That's one that gives everybody, you know, a lot of people pause. Jesus didn't just drive out a demon, he drove out a lot of demons. And again, the idea that there, there are spiritual forces in the world. Scripture is very clear about that. We think, well, I never saw them, I never heard them. Well, you know, there's a lot of things I haven't seen or heard that I still believe to be true. Um, I don't fully understand how electricity works, but I believe it's true. I believe it's real. I believe it's active in the world. I have seen <coughs> forces of evil. I've seen things happen that I believe is the devil incarnate, the devil active in the world. And so 
One of the things, in addition to preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus drove out demons. The demons are almost always the first ones to recognize Jesus' authority and power. They will call him the Son of God. They will recognize him, and in almost every case, at least in Mark, uh, the, the times when Jesus was in Jewish areas, he would order the demons to be quiet and not to vocally recognize who he was. I think there are several reasons for that. One, because he didn't want to be associated with those demons, because at one point the, the Pharisees accused him of driving out demons by the power of the devil. Okay? And so he didn't want he didn't want it to be the idea to go any further that these demons know who he is and he somehow has a relationship with them. <clears throat> but it's also true that if the demons acknowledged him as the Son of God, if there was a supernatural acknowledgement of him as the Son of God, the fear was that the Jews would prematurely lift him up and try to make Jesus uh, the king, the Messiah. That they would start a rebellion in order to put him in power, and that wasn't the time yet. And so uh, Jesus, we have the messianic secret in Mark where he's saying, you know, don't tell anybody. He told the demons to be quiet. He told the people he healed not to tell anybody because it wasn't time yet. And he was afraid that some. Now, he, he never says that when they're in a Gentile area. Caesarea Philippi, or the place of the Gadarenes, you know, the places where it was mostly Gentiles, he doesn't have that concern. But in the Jewish areas, he does. But he consistently drives out demons. And he makes it very clear, I believe, that driving out demons should, uh, by Jesus was a spiritual assault on the dominion of Satan by the kingdom of God. In other words, the devil, who is the ruler and master for a while of this world, who has power, who has control, who does possess, he and his, uh, his demons have the power to influence people, to possess them, to injure them. When Jesus drove out a demon, it was a practical demonstration that the kingdom of God was present and that the kingdom of God could assault very effectively whenever God chose the power of the devil and his demons. And that's why Jesus doesn't have to work anything up in order to drive out a demon. He just says, come out of him. And the demons come out. Um, there is no force necessary on Jesus' part. His authority is such that all he has to do is command, and it happens by fiat. Um, and again, I, I've often used the comparison between calling on the power of the one true God and of false gods was Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You know, the competition that Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to, and the prophets of Baal spent all day banging cymbals and drums and yelling and shouting and clanging their weapons and slashing their arms so that they were bleeding. And, you know, and the whole time Elijah's there trash talking them, saying, oh, is your God asleep? Are you trying to wake him up? Has he gone away? You know, so that you try to bring him back? You know, is there, is there some problem here? And after all day long of them doing that, Elijah says, okay, guys, it's my turn. And he says, I want you to pour, because they had an altar there with a sacrifice on it. He said, I want you to pour, soak that wood with water. And then he said, okay, do it again. Make sure it's really soaked so the water's running in the trench around it. And then he says, Lord, show them. Lightning comes from heaven, and the thing is, is burst into flames despite all the water instantaneously. Elijah didn't have to wake God up. He didn't have to cut himself. He didn't have to do anything except call on the power of God. Well, that's very much how Jesus did it as compared to others. The first century magician kind of idea. Jesus simply spoke and the demons came out. And those exorcisms were proof that the kingdom of God was present and that the kingdom of God was engaging and overwhelming without competition the kingdom of Satan. And he proved that to people. So, um... And the ultimate example of, I guess, jumping to the healing side again, uh, the ultimate example of Jesus' healing, miraculous healing, was the raising of the dead. There are at least three occasions that, that are recorded where Jesus raised the dead. There was Jairus' daughter, there was the widow's son, the widow of Zarephath, and Lazarus. And in each case, again, Jesus didn't have to use potions or magic charms or incantations or anything else. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came forth. He walked up to the the uh, tomb or to the coffin of the widow of Zarephath's son and reached in and had him stand up. Okay, you get the sense as though it just happens. There's no fanfare at all. Again, that's a demonstration of Jesus 
power that the kingdom of God has no competition. That while the kingdom of Satan may be ruling for now, in the face of the kingdom of God, the devil and his demons have no real power and certainly no authority. Now one thing too, people sometimes have asked, um, Jesus is called the firstborn of all creation, meaning the first resurrected. It's probably a good idea that we don't refer to some of the other uh, raising of the dead people like Lazarus or the widow of Zarephath's son or Jairus' daughter as being resurrections. They are more like, uh, they're better called resuscitations or revivications. Uh, meaning they were given their, their life back for now, but not resurrected in the same sense that Jesus was, because Jesus was resurrected to live forever. Uh, Lazarus and the others were revivified so that they would continue with their life for some period of time and then die again and be buried. That's different than the resurrection of Jesus. I've had people ask me in Bible study before, well, Jesus wasn't really the, the firstborn, because what about, what about Lazarus? Well, it's a different, different thing. Jesus revived or resuscitated those who had died. They really were dead. But he brought them back to life for the rest of their years and days. And then they would die again. Okay? Um, any questions about that? Yeah. I have a couple. One concerning, concerning miracles in the modern day. The Catholic Church, as they determine that uh, uh, someone's going to become a saint, they have to show three proven miracles. Right. This would be an example of scientifically, would the scientific world go along with the explanation? No, because all the church requires is testimony. That and, and most often those miracles are that someone prayed to this person, you know, the idea of the intercession of the saints for, for the people, that they prayed to this person and the thing they prayed for came to pass. There was a healing or there was something of that sort. Certainly not something that the scientific community would consider uh, valid experimentation, right? A demon, how was the, how, how was the demon recognized that? What was the visible symptoms? Were there any actually described? And in today's world, how might we be able to identify a demon possessed in the <laughs> There are no physical descriptions of the demons, and I, I think, think so. and I think they can take on whatever form. Um, do you all remember the, the movie The Fellowship of the Ring, where um, Bilbo is at the last only house, uh, is at Rivendell, and Frodo comes there, you know, and he's, he's, he's been hurt, and then he's recovering and everything else, and he goes in, and, and Bilbo says, by the way, do you have that old ring of mine? This is the ring of power, which is a symbol of power and evil. And uh, Frodo sort of is like, because it has power over the people who, who possess it. And then Bilbo said, I would just like to see it again. And Frodo goes, no. And there's this scene where Bilbo goes, ah, like this. And this scary, <laughs> scary wallet is like his eyes and teeth and ah, for just a split second. You know? And I always imagine that's probably what demon possession would look like if the demon ever decided to show themselves. Demons are fallen angels. But the fact is that even the devil, Satan, was Lucifer, the angel of light. Um, and that one of the things is that one of Lucifer's tricks is that he doesn't appear as a as horrible, ugly mean. That he appears as something beautiful. His success and temptation is that he usually that he appears as something beautiful. I've read um, many, many years ago a teacher who said that uh, he he woke up one night and he was feeling kind of troubled. And he he saw this bright light at the foot of his bed when he woke up. And you know, and it was sort of like suggesting an angelic form, but he was really unquiet in his soul, and then all of a sudden he realized it was a satanic presence. And his response as a committed Christian was, oh, it's just you. <laughs> and then he disappeared. And the movie guy testified to that. Now, he appeared in beautiful, beautiful form, but there was something in his heart that said there's something wrong here, and then he realized that Lucifer is the angel of light. And that was the original, I mean, that was who Satan was before the fall. And he has the ability to, to maintain that, to manifest that again. Um, and so I think the demons can present themselves quite beautifully. But there is, a, there is a, you say, how can we tell? There is a spiritual gift. The gift of discernment is the ability to tell good from evil. The ability to tell when something is wrong and is not what it appears to be. And the gift of discernment is given. It is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's given for the purpose 
of being able to determine when, the, when there is satanic influence, when there's demonic influence, um, and when something is not good, is not right, and should not be you know, held to. Kind of. I think what would be what is interesting if you look at the Old Testament at Saul, because Saul, of course, when it said that the, the spirit left him and an evil spirit came right. to Saul, and then you view Saul's actions afterwards, Saul would literally be crazy yeah. at times. But then there were other times when he was very lucid and he would realize the truth. And in a short time later, he was crazy again. Right. And, you know, it's just, it's a very uh, vivid view of what that could be. And in present day, if you even think of Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler was a brilliant leader. He was, I mean, so many things were so good, but on the other hand, he was crazy. Yeah. And when you look at many of the decisions he made toward the end of World War II, they were suicide. Uh, decisions that were not going to help his country at all, but they were only done out of extreme hate and malice. That if he was wanting to win the war, he would have done just the opposite, right. and well, eventually killing himself. Yeah, and there are various attributes that have been assigned to demonic possession over the years in terms of characteristics. In the same way that there are gifts of preaching and teaching and you know prophecy, in other words, of speaking God's word. One of the characteristics that have been attributed, and Hitler is one of the examples that they use for that, is the ability by satanic power, by demonic power, to sway people, to speak, and to convince people to follow, even in the direction you're going is not the right direction. You know, it's sort of the dark side of um, the gifts of preaching and teaching and prophecy and the spoken word on the, the, the spirit. <coughs> and so there is, you know, there is power there. But Again, the Holy Spirit has given the spirit uh, the the gift of discernment in order to help us deal with that. John, um, just going back a moment to what you were saying about Hume and his arguments and, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, his his defense just kind of breathes, reeks with this pride and arrogance. Because if I heard you correctly, you're saying that he's he kind of limited interpretation to the elite. Oh, the, the, the smart, the, the educated, the, 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 the elite. But Jesus, you know, he speaks parables to the elite. And he withholds information. So maybe Hume was not proposing a new idea as much as articulating what already existed. And Jesus, you know, later says, he goes to the Father, he says, you know, Lord, I'm so glad you revealed this to babies and withhold it from the elite. Yeah. And so when I see that, you know, I'm just I'm just so Yeah, but that's you know I agree. And the ironic part about David Hume, and again he was a hero of mine, is that um, he he recognized that that radical skepticism, which was the thing he reported and nobody's ever effectively disputed it philosophically. Um, he recognized it wasn't very practical. You know, you couldn't live that way. That you know you if you didn't believe that there was cause and effect, then you wouldn't know what to do right. next. Um, and so he said, you can't live by that, even though I've argued philosophically. And he apparently was a very gentle, very humble man. Despite the fact that you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it reading some of his stuff, he acted like a saint. The people who knew him thought he was just a wonderful human being, <laughs> So, um, by all accounts. And so that was one of the things, too, is that people, rather than just lambast him, unlike some German philosophers, which they could do that with, with him, you know, without feeling bad about it because they were just nasty individuals. Sorry, Bob. Um, <laughs> you know, he was a very gentle Scottish man who lived in the village and you know, went about his way, and people liked him. So it's a very strange thing. I think, again, the, the, when we talk about the teaching uh, and healing and exorcism of Jesus, all of it ties back to that theme, that key message of the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of God was the content of Jesus' teaching. It was uh, his healing and exorcism were demonstrations of that, that God's kingdom was present and it was powerful. It is already here, but it's not yet fulfilled. And that will come in the final day. We were talking at the break about people who are part of the prosperity gospel who say, well, we're fully redeemed now. We're redeemed in spirit, you know, mind, and body, and so therefore we should never have to get sick. I think you have to be pretty stupid to say that. 
besides being spiritually unattuned, because you only have to pay attention for a few minutes to say to see that very righteous people do get sick. You know, godly people do get sick. That to me, while our spirits can, you know, are redeemed, redemption is available to us. The kingdom of God has come into our midst in the presence of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice for us gives us freedom from sin. It is not yet. The redemption is not yet fulfilled. The culmination has not happened and will not until Jesus returns to the great white throne. But all of Jesus' teaching, all of his healing, all of his exorcism, everything was oriented toward us recognizing the authority and the power and the grace and mercy that is the kingdom of God in our midst. Any questions about any of that? Becky? Well, isn't that like, um, you know, our spirit, of course, is healed, but we are in an earthly body, and so we, we see our glorified body. Right. I mean, our bodies are in this earth, in an earthly realm, and um, so it is susceptible to some things, and, uh, but our spirit is, we are redeemed by Christ. Yep. Our spirit, but we're still in the earthly body. Yeah, now our spirits, and this is something that, that Christians disagree on, I believe that that even Christians, even committed Christians, can experience torment from demonic spirits. That we are not completely... Now, uh, I, I don't believe that a Christian can be completely over, taken over by demonic spirits. Mm -hmm. But in the same way that when we when the Holy Spirit comes into us and is present to us all the time, He doesn't He doesn't get rid of us. He doesn't you know He doesn't throw us out of the car. We're still here. We allow the Holy Spirit to drive. We allow the Holy Spirit to be present with us. But I think in the same way we sometimes can say no to the Holy Spirit. You know, push Him aside a little bit. I think He's always still present. We can accept. We can we can take on demonic influence as well. I mean, I've known Christian people who suffer from I believe demonic influence that affected them. Um, and so that spiritual realm is one in which there is still conflict going on. Even that's not, you know, in, in terms of the ultimate is settled. It is finished, Jesus said on the cross. You know, the, the, the deal is set. It's just a matter of waiting. And I used the example before of, you know, we signed the, the, the documents to purchase the property, but the closing hasn't happened yet. So it's our, but it's not yet ours. Already, but not yet. And so the same thing I think is true uh, in, in terms of our redemption. Yes, we are redeemed, and we look forward to that, and it will happen. But in the meantime, we struggle in a world that the devil still controls, and we, we, we're going to struggle with that. Anybody who says otherwise is either not paying attention or they're, they're misleading people. Uh, Especially if you, if you look at Hebrew, you, you use the, how the Jews look at redemption as right. returning home. Right. Uh, you, you could see where that would parallel with us returning to our point of origin with Christ. Yeah. And Paul and says then, that, you know, we groan yeah. under the current, uh, the current situation, awaiting the culmination. Kevin, one last thing? Uh, when It's just like when Jesus said, you know, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Just the opposite of that is true as well. When we embrace a lie, we become a slave. Yeah. And those and that that slavery is not just mental slavery. That's right. slavery in demonic form. Spiritual as well. Love. Yeah. Spiritual. Thank you all. Thank you especially for your patience for me running late today.